Good morning, church. It's good to see you. I see Mark and Tracy. Tracy. Yes, I haven't seen you in a while, yes? Oh, I'm glad you're here. Wow. I want to say congratulations to Rose and Donnie on that new baby, Donna Rose. And I uh, understand that uh, Donnie didn't do any of the work, that Rose delivered that child and conceived that child with the help of Donnie, but did conceive the child. So Rose, you've done good. What a beautiful child that is. I saw her on the internet. We were talking earlier this morning, Jamie and I, that the, actually the first meeting of this congregation, which was smaller, was in a little room down the road, the community building, 1972. A couple from Texas came to spread the word. They were supported by the University Church of Christ from Abilene Christian University. Their names were gone out of my head. Somebody say the names. Thank you. That was Ron Sanson. <laughs> Betty and Reiner Troop, they had been, been missionaries in Rhodesia for years, but something happened in Rhodesia where they had to leave. So they sent them to the Northeast as a mission trip. And they were from Texas. And as you know, Texas is a big state. And everything grows big in Texas. Uh, there are a lot of people from Texas with big egos. There was this Texas rancher. Had a pretty fair-sized ranch. Decided that he would go to Europe and just visit Europe for a while. Ran into a German farmer. You know, and in Germany, the farms are pretty tiny, maybe 100 acres. So he's getting a little bit prideful about his spread out in Texas, west of Abilene. And he says to him, uh, I can get up before dawn, just before dawn in the morning, hop in my pickup truck, drive all day, and as the sun sets, I still have not reached the edge of my property. And the German looks at him and says, I have a pickup just like that. Sorry, <laughs> but I like the story. I had originally, I had another theme that I wanted to uh, bring to you this morning. Uh, I spoke a little to Rhonda about it, but I'm going to just sort of introduce it a little bit. Uh, I'm reading a book. Does anybody know who Tony Evans is? Yes. Does anybody listen to WIHS? Okay, nobody. I listen to WIHS, and I quite often listen to Tony Evans. He's got a doctor in uh, theology from the Dallas Theological. What is that? Seminary. And I re he really strikes me as a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching. I don't agree with all his theology, but nonetheless, he says this about scriptures. I am tightly tethered to Scripture as my final authority on all matters to which it speaks. And it speaks on all matters. I seek to apply this comprehensive view of the Scripture to all of life. I am committed to the thesis that there are two answers to every question. God's answer and everyone else's. And when they contradict each other, everyone else is wrong. I, I subscribe to that view. I think we have a problem in the United States of America. And sometime in the future, not this morning, because it's Easter, I want to discuss it. And it has to do with a oneness. We need to be a one people. There need to be Christians who are black, Christians who are white, Christians who are Asiatic, Christians who are Hispanic, or how do you say that? Help me, Carlos, how do you say that? <laughs> you know? We're going to talk about a oneness. 
that the church needs. And this book addresses the need to change and the way we can change. And I think we need a dialogue. We're going to do that in the future. Not too distant future. And I'm willing to take a shot at it. So forgive me if I blow up on you. I don't know. Okay, back to today. Last Thursday, about 8 a.m., Ray and I were out doing our usual thing we do in the morning, which is we go to McDonald's, have a senior coffee, sausage McMuffin, right? And then we drive around. You know, we do that. We go to the one that's near Ollie's down here on Wilkes Street, right in the parking lot there. <laughs> it's a two for two we get, you know, two bucks for both of those things. And then they say, two dollars, please. Uh, and we're leaving. Ray says, we need to get the gas for uh, his uh, Subaru Crosstrek. So we headed for Costco on East Main Street in Waterbury. And you know, Frost Road comes. And after making a left turn onto East Main, I noticed there's an entrance to a rather large cemetery up on the hill. Anybody know it? No? Yeah? It's got, it's got a great statue. I call it great, but I don't know if it's an image or an idol. But anyway, it's a statue of Jesus, and I think Mary, his mother. I don't know. Who was the disciple that Jesus looked at and said, this is my mother, woman, this is your son, John? Okay, thank you. They help me with this, you know. I'm getting old. <laughs> Jay says that I have excuses, and you guys will forgive me. After making a left turn on East Main, I noticed that entrance at that large cemetery with a very large number of tombstones on the hill to my right. The name of the cemetery is Calvary Cemetery. I looked it up on the internet, I think. I felt an impulse to turn into the entrance. So I did. And as I drove by all the tombstones, a couple of thousand, I would guess, I wondered how many would get to go to heaven. Okay, I lost my paper. <laughs> Here we go, I hope. Here we go. Then I remembered that it was Easter this coming Sunday, and Jesus was raised from the dead after three days in the grave and gave us a hope of eternal life. But what about these people who are buried at Calvary Cemetery? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. Also, it says there is none righteous, no, not one, in Romans 3.10. The only way to become a righteous person, that is, a, a person in a right relationship with God, is by the sin-cleansing power of the red blood of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. In the water of baptism, you come in contact with that blood and are washed clean. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, that's God, except through me. So if the folks that are buried there have obeyed the gospel, we will see them in heaven. They are saved by grace. It is a gift from God, Ephesians 2.5. So if you are here this morning and you've been presented the gospel, please let someone know that we can do a Bible study or set up a study with you so we can close the deal, if you will. I'd like to say that's the end of the sermon, but it's not, so just sit still for a while. Meanwhile, back at Calvary Cemetery, Ray and I saw a great part of the cemetery that caught our interest. All the, all the tombstones were very small, and I mean 18 inches, tiny, and very old. We headed to that section. We took a while getting there, but we headed to that section of the cemetery, and we're looking for the oldest and smallest. We come across a plain one that we could read. No name was visible, but the date of birth and death were clearly readable. Born April 4, 1931. Died 
April 11, 1931. Touched my heart. One week old. Surely that baby's in heaven. Amen to that. We discovered that all the graves in that section of Calvary Cemetery were for children. And then this, this thought occurs to me as I stand there. And I wondered if any of the dead babies were black or white or Asian or Hispanic or Native American or any one of a number of races or ethnicities. And then my next thought really shook me up. Why would I think that? Am I a racist? It's quiet in here. I like that. <laughs> All right, you guys are thinking. Okay. We're going to leave that now. We're going to go. I, I spent some time walking and looking through Calvary Cemetery. It's a good place to do that because it's an oasis of, an oasis of solitude. You can look out and see 84 going by and East Main going by, you know. Have you ever, you remember this cemetery at all? It's up on a hill, and it's got lots of, lots of, lots of tombstones in it. As I walked, I read the markers. As cemeteries go, Calvary is an intimate place, taking up only a few blocks of its Waterbury home neighborhood. Each stone marker summed up a whole life in a kind of obituary. Shorthand, a name, two dates, and a dash. I happened to find a gravestone for Jesse Spray, about whom I know nothing except for the dates and the inscription on the granite. Jesse Spray, November 12, 1845, dash. December 20, 1925. Below was this lovely tribute. A kind wife mourns in thee, a husband lost. The poor, a friend of who felt. The poor, a friend who felt what friendship cost. I'm sorry, let me read it again. A kind wife mourns in thee, a husband lost. The poor, a friend who felt what friendship cost. Generals, titans of industry, are buried next to those who were in this life were who, who in this life were relatively unknown. But the engraving on the stone is the same for all of them: a day of birth, a day of death, a little dash representing the in between. So many thoughts crowd the mind. I wondered about the thousands of people buried here. The markers read, Beloved Mother, Faithful Father, Rest in Peace. Several quoted the words of Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. On a tombstone inscription of a young woman who died at the age of 30 in 1940, 1914, the inscription read, Just when we learn to love her most, God called her back to heaven. Made me think of my wife, but anyway. I found numerous markers for children who died in infancy. One marked the burial spot of little Sydney, who lived 19 months. Another memorialized Dora Lee Scram, who lived only 28 days before she died, September 3, 1890. As I walked them on the gravestones, Alone with my thoughts, it occurred to me that the cemetery was quiet and peaceful. Exactly what a cemetery should be. It was probably very much like a certain cemetery outside of Jerusalem. It was a garden cemetery, a little collection of tombs dug out of solid rock. That's where the Jews buried their dead looking for a better life. In, on a Friday afternoon, just before sundown, they buried the body of Jesus there. The Bible mentions four times that Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. It belonged to a rich man named Arimathea. 
He was a prominent figure, figure in the local society because he was rich. He also was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling religious body. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John combined to tell us the story. Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised. He's dead already? Crucifixion is a hideous way to die. The Romans use it to send a message to the onlookers. Behold the power of imperial Rome. Strong men sometimes hung on the cross for several days before they died. But Jesus died after only six hours. They didn't have to break his legs. That was a cruel form of torture intended to hasten death because he was already dead. When they took Jesus from the cross, his body was in bad shape. It bore all the marks of the abuse, of the abuse he had suffered. He was covered with blood. There was a hole in his side. His face was horribly disfigured, and skin hung down from his back in tatters. Joseph and Nicodemus wrapped the body in strips of linen cloth. They sprinkled about 80 pounds of spice throughout the linen strips. Part of it was a kind of ground powder, the other part a gummy substance. The spices made the linen strips stick together to form a tight, wrap around the body. That was how the Jews involved their dead. It was getting near sundown now. They created a problem. That created a problem because the Old Testament forbade the Jews to handle a dead body on the Sabbath. Because there was no time to find a new grave, Joseph volunteered his own. The Bible says it was fresh, newly dug out of the rock. No one had ever been laid there yet. That was Joseph meant for his own family to be buried there someday. But for the moment, everything is put aside. Joseph and Nicodemus pick up the limp, lifeless corpse of Jesus, half carrying, half dragging it to the nearby garden tomb. Between the weight of the body and the linen and the spices, it must have weighed 250 pounds. Meanwhile, the sun slowly sank beneath the western horizon, and shadows fall across the olive trees. The two, nah, the two men, secret disciples, carry the dead body of Jesus to the tomb. <coughs> Close behind are Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, weeping. The little cemetery outside Jerusalem is still there. The whole area is filled with little openings dug out of the mountainside. The entrance to the tomb is so low that you had to duck to get in. Inside it was dark, almost pitch black, musty and damp. They laid the body of Jesus on a ledge and turned to go. When they got outside, Joseph and Nicodemus rolled a great stone over the entrance. The women sat by the side watching. Then Joseph and Nicodemus left, and the two Marys left as darkness fell on the garden cemetery. Inside the tomb, silence. The smell of death was everywhere. The Bible says very little about that Saturday. We know about Good Friday and Easter Sunday, but of that Saturday in between, we know almost nothing. At some point, the Romans put a seal on the stone to keep people out of the tomb. Luke summarizes that very day simply, and on the Sabbath, they rested. But all of Sunday, the Bible is very clear. Mark says, very early on the first day of the week. Luke says, on the first day of the week at early dawn. John says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb. The women came to anoint the body of Jesus. They, weren't expecting a they were not expecting a resurrection. 
That was the farthest thing from their minds. But their shock and surprise and utter confusion when they got to the tomb, the seal was broken, the guards had disappeared. Praise God, the tomb was empty. What had happened? No one could say for sure. Two angels stood beside them and uttered two of the most powerful sentences in the Bible. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Mary ran and found Peter and John. By what the angels had said, she didn't, have a, didn't believe it at first. After the horrific events on Friday, it was important to imagine Jesus coming back from the dead. I'm sorry. It was impossible to imagine Jesus coming back from the dead. When they got the news, Peter and John ran to the tomb. John got there first, but Peter went inside. But by, the Bible tells us what he found, John 20 and 7. When Peter entered the tomb, he saw the linen cloth lying there and the head cloth wrapped beside it. I think it means that the linen were like an empty shell, as if whoever had been inside had simply passed right through them, like a cocoon after the butterfly has flown away. Then Mary met Jesus, alive from the dead. Then two disciples on the road to Emmaus met Jesus, alive from the dead. Then the apostles met Jesus, alive from the dead. Then Doubting Thomas met Jesus, alive from the dead. Then 500 people at one time met Jesus, alive from the dead. The message went out. He's alive. 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, Peter stood to preach in Jerusalem. He preached to the very people who had, people who had crucified Jesus. His blood, was on his, his blood was on their hand. In that sermon, he said these words. You nailed Jesus of Nazareth to a cross and put him to death. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it is impossible for death to keep its hold on him. On the walls of a Sunday school classroom in California, there is a bit of graffiti. Christ rose from the dead. You can't keep a good man down. That's what Peter said. Death could not hold him. It's an old system, an old hymn that goes like this. Death cannot keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior. He took the bars away. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor o'er the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Hallelujah. It's Easter Sunday. At Calvary Cemetery, everything is quiet, peaceful, beautiful. There are no resurrections yet. I'll never forget the first, oh. Did he really rise from the dead? I went home and thought about it. Was it true? Could I believe it? Many people have been to the cemetery and wondered the same thing. If you just go on what you see, it's a hard decision, hard doctrine to believe. The odds seem against it. No one living today has ever seen a resurrection because there hasn't been one in 2,000 years. If you go to the cemetery and wait for one, 
you'll be waiting a long, long, long time. As I thought about these things, the Lord seemed to say to me, Son, you've been looking in the wrong place. Come with me. It seemed as if the Lord took me to a great city, to a grove of a trees on a hillside outside the city. Among the trees on the hillside, I saw a cemetery. The Lord pointed a, to a certain tomb. The stone had been rolled away. Look inside. When I looked inside, I didn't see anything except for some rumbled linens and a cloth folded in a corner. Then it hit me. The tomb was empty. Whoever had been there was gone, and he left his grave clothes behind. My friends, I do not believe the resurrection of the dead. I do not believe in the resurrection of the dead because of anything I could say. I can, I'm sorry, let me start again. My friends, I do not believe in the resurrection of the dead because of anything I can see with my eyes. Everything I see argues against it. On every hand, I see death and decay. If you go only by what you see, you'll end up believing that death wins in the end. But that's not what the Bible says. Let me say it again. That's not what the Bible says. I believe in the resurrection of the dead because I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday morning. The Bible says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That's you and me. You believe you've been baptized? That's you and me. There's good news from the graveyard today. Good news that the tomb is empty. Good news that Jesus rose from the dead. Good news that the devil couldn't hold him. Good news that the death has lost its sting. Good news that the grave has lost its victory. Good news that we need not fear death anymore. As far as I know my, in my heart, I am not afraid to die. Not because I am especially brave or courageous. I'm neither of those. I do not make light of the awesome power of death. but I'm not afraid to die because I know what's on the other side. My Lord has come back and told me what I can expect. I don't have anything to worry about at all. If you hear that I have died tonight, when you bury me, I want you to make a sign with a stake, write on it, stick it on my grave, write on it, temporary residence. I'm coming back. You can bet on it. I say that without any sense of pride or boasting, for my resurrection does not depend on me. It does not depend on my good deeds. It does not depend on any merit in me at all. It wholly depends on the Lord Jesus Christ. who rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. He promised if I would trust in him, someday I would rise with him. I stake my entire life on that promise. If it's not true, I have no other hope. Death will not have the last word. We think we are going from the land of the living to the land of the dead. No, we are going from the land of the dying to the land of the living. Amen. I, I ran across a wonderful phrase from the pulpit commentary that lifts my heart every time I read it. There will be victory in the last battlefield. Life is a series of battle, all of us, for all of us. And we all take it on the chin, sooner or later. But in the last battle, the struggle with death. There is victory for the children of God. Good news from the graveyard. That's a place, strange place for good news. But that's what Easter is all about. 
It's not Happy Easter. It's not the little bunny that hops around. It's not colored eggs and chocolate. It's all about good news from the graveyard. That you are not done. If you believe and are baptized, you're not done. You're coming back. You can count on it. The Bible says so. I believe it. If you're looking for Jesus on Easter Sunday, don't look in the graveyard. He isn't there. He left 2,000 years ago and never went back. The really good news is this. If you are looking for Jesus today, you can meet him right now. May I introduce you to him? His name is Jesus of Nazareth. He is called the Son of God. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. He was buried in Joseph's tomb. He rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. He paid for your sins so that if you believe in him, you will never perish but have everlasting life. You can have everlasting life. You can know your sins are forgiven. You can have victory on the last battlefield. The living Lord Jesus Christ would like to meet you right now. Will you give your heart to him? Will you trust in him? Will you come to him? I pray you will. This could be the happiest Easter of your life. You will come to Jesus. The next move is up to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus, who died now, lives again, a living Lord. Be born anew in our hearts today. You lead us to the empty tomb. Let faith rise to banish our fears. For those who doubt, help them to believe all over again. Thank you that you do not worship a dead, that we do not worship a dead Jesus. Because of Easter, we worship a living Christ. Glory to his name forever. As I read that, it struck me that I should have told you at the beginning that I did not write that. That was written by Ray Pritchard in April 1st, 2018. If you would like to be baptized and uh, place your membership, Church of Christ in Waterbury, Connecticut, now's the time. You can come forward as we sing, or you can contact someone next to you and say, hey, you know, I'm really too bashful to go forward, but I'd like to study more, and, and we'll arrange for that. If uh, you'd like to testify now, I'm willing to listen to you. Anybody want to stand up and testify? There's a tradition in, in, in some churches and when someone says, I'll tell you the story. Some thousand so or so years ago, there was a Christian who was about to be executed for his beliefs. And he was given the opportunity to say his last words. And unbeknownst to the uh, authorities that were about to execute him, all the Christians were gathered on a hill around the execution point. And, uh, okay, what are the last words that you would like to say? And he said, he is risen. And all these folks around him on the hill, he is risen indeed. Those words encapsulate the promise and assurance of the hope that is the gift of this day. 
He is risen. He is risen indeed. Funny thing, these cherished words that were so readily and faithfully shared with each other were not spoken on the first Easter. Having returned from their mind-blowing experience of the empty tombs, we are told that the, woman, the women came back and pronounced that he is risen. However, and I like the fact that it's in the present tense. You know, in the Bible it says, I'm not correcting the Bible, but this is one man's opinion. <laughs> he is risen rather than, I've seen it, he has risen. He is risen. He's alive and well and living in America, if you will. But, all right. However, instead of being greeted with, he is risen indeed, instead of shouts of praise and hallelujahs, the response on the part of the disciples was unnerving. Luke, our gospel writer, tells us that the disciples considered what the woman shared with them to be an idle tale. However, our Bible translators have softened this response a bit. A celebrated preaching professor tells us that the word translated as idle tale is the Greek word leros, and it occurs only once in the whole scripture. And my friends, it doesn't mean idle tale. No, this word leros is harsh, defiant, and dismissive. The word leros literally means garbage, waste. Now consider for this, consider for a moment this. The typos, that is the band of brothers who journeyed with Jesus and now have churches named after them, upon first hearing the news of the resurrection of Jesus, looked around at each other, looked at the women, shake their heads and collectively say, that's a load of garbage. Can you imagine? Perhaps the resurrection has become tame for us too. Perhaps after all these years, we say, he is risen. He is risen indeed, without the wonder it deserves. For our claim of the empty tomb is nothing less than astonishing, bewildering, reality changing. The empty tomb invites us to trust what we cannot see. The empty tomb challenges us to live fully, even when life is not fully in our control. The empty tomb demands we seek to understand, especially when things are difficult to understand. The empty tomb dares us to trust the kingdom of God has come near in Jesus. Therefore, the resurrection is more than just a suspension of natural law. And whether you believe it happened, the resurrection is an invitation to life in a new reality, the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, we believe life will always defeat death, even evidence to the contrary. And the contrary evidence is the reality for the disciples during that very first week. We should not be too hard on the disciples for their hesitancy to accept the news of the resurrection. Their initial resurrect reaction was born from a place of fear and uncertainty. Remember, they were hiding in fear their beloved rabbi, dead, their dreams and visions of life shattered. They can be shown mercy, I believe, for doubting what they heard. We often do the same thing. Let's pray. Almighty Father in heaven, creator of all, sovereign over heaven and earth, over everything that is and ever will be, we come humbly praising your name and glorifying you. Father, as we remember the day that your son rose from the dead through your power, we claim his a, as our Lord. We know that he died for each of us individually, for all of the sins we have created, all of the sins we have sinned, all that we do sin and all that we will sin are covered by the red blood of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.